Okay, so this time we're talking about percent composition, which is sometimes called percent composition by mass because we use the masses in order to get this percent. So this is going to be covering page five from top to bottom. There's a couple of places where I'm going to have you finish the calculations, and those are the parts that you have to do in order to get your stamp, you know, along with the rest of it. So let's go ahead and get started. At the top of the page, we have two equations for our percents that we're going to be calculating, although really when it comes down to it, all percents really follow the same basic structure. And that percent is going to be equal to the part that you care about divided by the whole thing, times 100. So in these two equations, the only difference is really what they're specifying as the whole. So sometimes you're going to be given a compound and you're going to take the mass of that individual element divided by the whole molar mass of the compound times 100. Sometimes you're going to be given a specific sample with a certain amount of stuff in it and so then you're going to take the mass of that element that it talks about divided by the total mass of all of that stuff together, times 100. So just make sure that you remember the basic format of a percent, and you're fine. You don't really need to memorize one of these equations or the other. So in that first problem, if we read through it, it says, find the percent composition of ammonium carbonate. A 15-gram sample contains this much nitrogen, this much hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So as we're reading through that, we should hopefully notice that we have this 15 gram sample. That is our total sample, the total mass of that sample. And so this is technically kind of that second equation. So we're gonna take the mass of each element divided by the total mass of the sample. And we are gonna have to do that for each of these elements that it gave us because it doesn't specify to find just the percent composition of nitrogen or hydrogen. It just says find the percent composition, so that means that it wants all of them. So I'm just kind of emphasizing these numbers and which elements they belong with. And now we're going to do each of these. So there's four calculations we're going to do. And technically, if you look at the amount of space that you've got in there, you probably, unless you write really, really tiny, might have trouble fitting all four of those calculations in this little space. So feel free to go up here and use as much space as you need up here. Um, as long as you can kind of fit two in each of those spaces, you should be fine on space overall. So let's get back to that problem. Okay, so we need to do each of these elements, and I am going to specify which element I'm working with each time, just so that we won't get confused just by all these percents floating around on the page. So nitrogen, the part of this sample that was from nitrogen was 3.11 grams, dividing by our total, which is 15.0. And then of course, times 100 is gonna give us 20.7%. That's done. Now I need to do the same thing for each of my other elements. Hydrogen had 1.88. I still have that same total mass for our total sample. Times 100 is going to get us a percent composition of 12.5%. You'll notice on each of these that I rounded this to three significant figures because over in my problem, each of these numbers had three significant figures. So just following the numbers that I plugged into this equation. Finishing this off, I'm gonna leave carbon and oxygen to you to do. Set it up, work it out the same way as this nitrogen and hydrogen. Just use the numbers for carbon and oxygen. Get your percents out. So. That's one type of percent composition problem we can have. One of the other types, if we go to the next problem, just gives us the question, determine the percent composition of sodium sulfate, which it gives us the formula for. So this is more of that first equation type problem where it just gives us a compound. We have to find the molar mass of that compound and then use the mass of each of the elements in order to find the percent composition. So real quick off to the side, I'm gonna find the molar mass of Na2SO4, and I'm gonna show my work as I'm doing it. That's actually gonna be important in a second. 
So here I took my two sodiums and each sodium is 22.990 and then I multiplied that by two because there's two of them and that got me 45.98. There's just one sulfur, so we see that there, and then four oxygen. So these are the four different masses for my four different elements, and then I added them up to get the total molar mass. Now, the reason that that's so important is I'm about to use these numbers to find the percent composition of each of these elements. And so, because I wrote them down individually along the way, means I'm not gonna have to go back now after finding my molar mass and get both of those sodiums to put on top of my sodium percent comp problem. So showing that little bit of work first is helping me now. So all I have to do is put that 45.98 on top because that's the sodium part over the total mass of the compound then times 100, and that's going to get me 32.37%. This time I'm keeping four sig figs because that was the least number of sig figs out of all the numbers that I had put together. Then sulfur, take its mass from our compound over the total mass times 100, and this time it's going to give me Ooh, I'm going to need five sig figs in this answer. So that's going to be 22.575%. And that was five sig figs because that was the least number of sig figs I was given there. And then oxygen. I'm going to let you finish up with. Now, a uh, good way to check your work here after you get all of these percents is just add up and make sure that they end up being 100%. This one does end up being exactly perfectly 100%, but sometimes it might end up being like 99.6 or 99.9 .9 or 100.01 or something. So as long as it's basically 100, you've done it right. If you end up with 150 or like 82, then you did something wrong. So set this up, work it out. I don't want you to just find this answer. Remember, work is worth just as much as your answer. So, next problem looks basically the same, except here they didn't give us the formula. You have the f skills to find that formula, though. This is calcium bromide. No prefixes tells me that this is an ionic compound, and I need to find the symbols and charges because if I don't have prefixes there to tell me how many of each I need, I need to figure out that number from cross-dropping and reducing these charges. So bringing them over and down, dropping the signs, gets me CABr2. So finding the molar mass of that brings me here. And this time I'm actually going to leave you to set up the calcium problem and get my answer for us, I'm going to do the bromine part, just so that you can kind of check your work. So taking bromine's mass over the total times 100. If you have any questions on how to find molar masses, please ask me when we get to class. Um, I'm kind of glossing through that because it is so straightforward. And so this should end up being... Six sig figs, wow, okay. So that's point nine four nine six. I know that that seems like a lot of sig figs, but like three is normal. And so this is twice as long, but it's a whole three more numbers to write down. Don't complain about it, it's not that long. So that is our answer. You go ahead and figure out calcium's answer by plugging in its mass and doing the math for us real quick. So now, the other type of problem that you might have that's still asking you to find percent composition, but it looks like a big scary problem because it's talking about finding the percent of water in a hydrate of zinc sulfate heptahydrate. This is all so complicated looking, but if we focus on what it's asking, it wants us to find the percent composition of water in a hydrate. So when I'm thinking about my uh, percent formula, the part I care about is the water and then the whole is the hydrate and what it tells us later on is that hydrates 
are crystals that has water as part of that crystal. And so it just kind of helps stabilize the rest of that ionic compound in order to get this nice crystal structure. And it goes on to tell us that we have 20 grams of that hydrate. So that's actually the number I'm gonna to have to plug in here for my hydrate. So it tells us one of the things that I need. And then it says resulted in 14.5 grams of anhydrous salt. So that might sound a little bit confusing and it doesn't tell you quite as much information as you might want to know. Like, what is it doing to result in this? So this person is probably heating this hydrate crystal, this crystal that has water in it. And when you heat the crystal, the water goes away, it evaporates, and all that's left is the salt. And we call that anhydrous because it no longer has the water, the hydro part of it, but it normally does have it there to stabilize it. So it's anhydrous, it's without water. And so that doesn't exactly tell me how much water I have. Oop, that's not what I was wanting. It doesn't tell me how much water I have, but if I compare the mass of my crystal without water to the mass of my crystal with water, meaning subtract the two, then the difference between these two numbers is the amount of water. So I am basically doing exactly what I thought, putting water, the part I care about, over the total. Of course, then we're gonna have to multiply by 100, and that's gonna get us 27.5%. So, kinda weird problem, but if you come back to the basics of what is a percent, it's really not that bad. So, last problem on the page asks us to calculate the mass of bromine and 25 grams of calcium bromide. Now, this doesn't even say anything about a percent, and technically you don't have to solve it with the percent composition information, but you can use it to get there. And what I mean by can is, let's imagine that if I did know that this was 50% bromine in this calcium bromide, just say I did, then I could take point five zero, which is the decimal form of our percent. So 50%, you move the decimal twice uh, from 50 to get 0.5. And if you take that, oop, that went away. So if we're multiplying that by 25, then that would get me my answer. But unfortunately for us, it's not 50% water. But luckily for us, earlier we did solve for the percent of bromine in calcium bromide. I believe it was question number three, and we came up with 79.9496. And so the decimal form of that, moving the decimal twice, would be 0.799496. So, if I did already have that percent given to me, or if I went ahead and did the work to find it, then I could take the decimal form of that percent, multiply by the mass of the compound that we have, and when we do that, technically this ends up being 19.9, oh, where is it? 9874. And because we just want to round that to three sig figs, the eight would round that nine up and that would round that. Long story short, it ends up being 20.0 to get it to three sig figs. And that is our answer. Now I'm going to show you a couple other ways to solve this, but that way will always work. Now the reason I'm showing you alternate methods is because even though this looks pretty quick and simple, there's a whole lot of kind of background math in finding this. Remember, we had to take calcium bromide, write the formula, find the molar mass of it, take the mass of bromine, divided by that molar mass times 100, round that answer to get this percent. Then we have to divide by 100, which is technically undoing all of the work we just did to turn that into our decimal form, and then multiply it by this other number in order to get our answer. So that is actually a little bit more complicated if they don't give you the percent. If they give you the percent, obviously this is the quickest way. But if it's not, like I said, we're kind of taking the percent, which looks like this, before we plug any numbers into it, and then we're dividing by 100, which basically just cancels this part out. So we're kind of just setting up a fraction or proportion of the amount of bromine to calcium bromide. 
and we could set that equal to if we wanted to figure out how much of this bromine is we'd put our x on the top with the bromine part of things and if I had 25 grams of the calcium bromide. So this is a proportion now that I could plug those masses into and then now we could do that whole cross multiply and then divide thing like your math teachers have taught you or really just get x by itself. All we have to do is multiply by 25 on both sides. And then over here, 25 and divided by 25 cancel out. And our x is equal to 25 times this proportion. So that would also get us there. It's a pretty simple way. You guys are pretty comfortable with proportions. So if you see this question, then feel free to use a proportion. Now, when we look at this a little bit closer, you might start to think, hey, wait a second. That, if you're not erasing it, starts to look kind of like some dimensional analysis with my given over here and then some kind of conversion factor there. So let's go ahead and explore this just a little bit more in this little remaining space we have left. If we treat that given, the only number we have in our problem, that's 25 grams of calcium bromide. If my focus is on getting rid of that calcium bromide, the grams of calcium bromide and getting grams of bromine technically in this problem in this formula it has two bromines and you'd have to remember that but now we're just back to finding the masses of these two things and putting them on top and bottom so it's the same numbers we've already seen the only difference here is that I had started with these units and I used the units of grams of calcium bromide and grams of bromine in order to put the numbers where they belong here. It's really about how you're thinking about the problem, how you're analyzing it, and getting to that answer. So any of these three ways are all going to get you to the same answer, 20.0 grams. And so it just matters how you look at the problem and how you can figure out how to work this out. There's always going to be problems or I have to see how well you can do dimensional analysis. And I'm going to tell you, use dimensional analysis to solve these problems. If you've wrapped your brain around it and you know how to do dimensional analysis so well, this is a great problem to do dimensional analysis on. It can solve lots of different types of problems. Or go with your gut, go with your instincts, and use a proportion because you can rely on it. But even if you can't remember how to do either of those, you can use the percent idea and multiply that times the mass. So I'm sure there's other ways you can think of that and find how to work this out, but one way or the other, we need to get to that number. So that's it. Make sure you've finished up those other problems that I had left for you so you can get your stamp, and that's it for tonight.